On tonight's CTV News, the owner of an illegal brothel is being taken to court by the City Council, and we have an exclusive interview with Tim Grafton, Chief Executive of the Insurance Council. This is CTV News, I'm Grant Mangan. After nearly a year of complaints, the Christchurch City Council is finally taking the owner of an illegal brothel to court. This is the first court case of its kind in Christchurch. Marcus Gibbs reports. Amidst a row of quiet homes in England Street sits an illegal brothel. On Tuesday, the Christchurch City Council is taking its owner to court because the brothel is operating outside of the permitted areas. It's a victory for Wayne Hawker, a strong opponent to the brothel within his street. I believe it is the first time this has been taken to court and I'm absolutely wrapped that I've been able to lead the charge for this community. He might be happy that the City Council is trying to shut the brothel down, but its owners sure aren't. An abatement notice was first lodged in September last year and it's taken this long for the case to get to court. While at times it has been frustrating, you know, there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy that you have to go through to make sure that, you know, the outcome is, follows all due process. Despite the looming court date, the brothel was very busy when CTV was filming. In the space of half an hour, two customers came and then went, scared off by the presence of our cameras in the street. One woman arrived at the address while we were filming. I approached and introduced myself, but she denied it was in fact a brothel. What do you mean it's not what I think it is? What is it? It's actually someone that lives here. So it's not a brothel at all. Wayne has also alleged that some of the girls working at the brothel have been illegal immigrants. The reality is if the visitors to Christchurch or to New Zealand, they cannot be working in a brothel because they will not have a visa, a work visa that allows them to do this type of work. Immigration New Zealand has confirmed today that two people working at the England Street premises were found to be unlawfully in New Zealand and have since been deported. Wayne says the brothel needs to go. As we know brothels do attract undesirables and families were worried about their children. Last year Wayne's crusade made headlines when he started publishing the registration details of clients visiting the brothel on Facebook. He says they were coming at all hours of the day and night. He vowed then that he would put this illegal brothel out of business. And if I can take the lead and show other people out there in the community, if you have a voice, it will be heard. you just got to be persistent, and I'm more than willing to help other communities in their fights as well. Wayne's promising to be seated at the front of the public gallery when this case is heard in the Christchurch District Court next Tuesday. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. The University of Canterbury is asking the Christchurch City Council to exclude the university from the local alcohol policy ban. No drinking alcohol in public places. A submission heard at the council hearings panel meeting today saw Canterbury University and their student association strongly oppose the amendment, including the university in the proposed alcohol bylaw. Canterbury University's pro-chancellor Sue McCormick says the university support the local alcohol policy but don't want it to include the university. The pro-chancellor says the university already has policies put in place. The university has its own um, alcohol policies and we believe it's too intrusive. We're an open um, community and we want public to be able to go in there and to enjoy our grounds and we don't want to be fenced off and we believe that we are um, absolutely capable of controlling our own students within our own grounds. Over 1,000 students live on campus in the various hostels in the island area. Sue McCormick says any alcohol related disturbances are monitored by the on-campus security. We have security team that are 24-7 on our grounds and you know we believe that we can control ourselves and don't really need another entity to keep control of our own students. Christchurch City Councillor David East says after the earthquakes many suburbs in Christchurch grew significantly. Upper Rickerton being one of these areas is now being re-looked at for the proposed alcohol policy. The general shift of population has been to the west and we now have um, a lot of uh, previous inner city um, hospitality is now focused on the, the uh, Rickerton area so um, we need to overcome some of the problems there. So we've 
Overall, 13 submitters agreed with the proposed area for the alcohol ban. David E says the university is a big part of the Rickerton and Islam area. Looking at how to reduce the alcohol-related disturbances is a part of the policy-making process. The problem for the university is, is more in legislation where the Local Government Alcohol Amendment Act of a couple of years ago has redefined public places. So we're not actually debating that issue today, but there could be some, uh, some issue going forward with that definition of public places. The University of Canterbury Student Association President Sarah Platt says the UCSA strongly opposed police regulating alcohol consumption on private property with public access. We're asking the council to um, relook at um, the proposed submission around um, the uh, liquor ban and the um, private property with public access um, clause uh, that's in the submission. We don't think that that's something that should be um, kept in there. The university security worked well with the police with complaints and incidents in the university area. For the public streets such as Island or Clyde Roads, not on campus, if an incident occurs, security assesses the situation and hands it over to the local police. In the last few years, Sarah Platt says the number of complaints received has decreased. The UCSA says in 2012 they had 17 complaints and in 2013, 13. Sarah Platt says for the university, in 2012 the number was 67 and in 2013 only 27. For us that's something that's really positive to see that our students are becoming active, engaging members of the, um, of the community and remembering to be good neighbours. I think that that's something we really try and get across to our students to you know, remember to be good neighbours and let your, let your um, neighbours know if you're having a party and make sure you clean up afterwards and, and hopefully that is something that seems to be coming across so that's really positive. The University of Canterbury is still dealing with the drop in enrolments following the Canterbury earthquakes. Wanting campus to be an attractive and vibrant place, the university believe the proposed alcohol bylaw may put them at a disadvantage. UCSA President Sarah Platt says they want students and young people to re-engage with the community. Hoping to take away the misconception that students are all bad, she believes the figures point out student behaviour is getting better. I think that's a positive change and I think it will help for other members of the community to see that it's not about us and them. It's, you know, a lot of students do want to become engaged members of society and I think that um, for our students to do that is something that's really great for us to see, so it's a positive step. The current permanent alcohol ban on the Rickerton Island area has been in place since March of this year and expires on the 31st of August. Joelle Batista, CTV News. The hearings panel recommended the council approve the amendment to make the Upper Rickerton Island temporary alcohol ban area permanent, excluding the university campus. The recommendations will need to be considered by the full council before the bylaw is adopted. New Zealand First MP Winston Peters has made true on his promise to reveal earthquake fraud this week. Mr Peters first made indirect allegations earlier this week during the filming of CTV's Lynched. Yesterday in Parliament, he accused Brian Staples of earthquake fraud. Brian Staples back at work following allegations from New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters over earthquake fraud. Reliable information has come to us of a long list of fraudulent practices carried out by Brian Staples and his various companies. Mr Brian Staples has used his companies to defraud, mislead and cheat people and it's not a laughing matter. Winston Peters then accused Brian Staples of telling his staff not to file GST returns or pay income tax. That is absolute garbage, yeah, absolute rubbish. Mr Peters has also alleged Mr Staples hasn't been paying subcontractors employed by his company, Earthquake Services. Mr Staples is the man of course who's been painting himself on TV as the modern Robin Hood. Well, he's halfway there. He's taking from ordinary people, but he's not giving it to the poor. Mr Peters then accused Mr Staples of using disputes as a way to avoid paying contractors. He says Mr Staples has been employing unqualified staff who have been carrying out earthquake inspections. But my concern is, if New Zealand First is aware of them, what on earth is going on with the Minister and the relevant government departments? IRD, MB, the SFO, what have they been doing? No firm action from these agencies. 
And I want to ask Mr Brownlee, stop pleading and explaining what you haven't done. Why don't you get off your broad half egg and do something for these people down there? Brian Staples denies all allegations. So is anything he said true? Absolutely not. Not one skerrick of it. Our business is open. Anybody can come in and have a look any time. I was really shocked that Winston Peters has come out and made these allegations. We've known about these allegations for quite some time and we've taken court action against the perpetrators. The, the whole matter is before the court right now. Mr Staples says he hadn't even heard from the MP before yesterday's stunt in Parliament. I'm surprised that Peters has decided to use um, parliamentary privilege to out make these allegations to the public without even hearing my side of the story. Mr Staples says the problem stems from a gang trying to extort $200,000 from him. We've blurred the Facebook profiles of these two alleged gang members. Brian Staples says they've even threatened to kill him. So how did it get to this point? That's a long story and it's all before the court. Um, and it's probably better to leave it for the court decision because when that comes out, then it'll be a lot easier for everybody to understand. A number of other similar allegations about Brian Staples were made to the police, the Serious Fraud Office and IRD in May. The court case is set for mid-August. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. The Prime Minister has rejected Transport Minister Jerry Brownlee's resignation over a breach of aviation rules earlier today. Minister Brownlee admitted breaching airport security by entering the gate lounge through a door usually used as an exit only. The minister was running late for his plane but says this was no excuse for bypassing a security check. However, the Prime Minister is allowing Brownlee to stay on as Transport Minister because of his good work record. He's offered his resignation. I've decided on balance not to accept his resignation. You know, making that decision, I uh, consider the whole matter very seriously. But I'd have to say, I had to weigh up all of the tremendous things he's done in uh, the six years he's served as a minister. I think he's made a stupid mistake. I'm absolutely confident he'll never repeat that again. The Commonwealth Games have kicked off in Glasgow, but could they be heading our way in the future? Hosting another Commonwealth Games could be on the cards for New Zealand. That's the optimistic message from New Zealand's Olympic Committee President Mike Stanley. His view was delivered after the Commonwealth Games Federation held its General Assembly in Glasgow, where they discussed the financial viability of the four-year competition. Mr Stanley told Fairfax Media that Auckland and Christchurch were obvious candidates. Although Mr Stanley believes right now wouldn't be the right time, but says he's absolutely sure New Zealand will host the Games in the future. But Christchurch is no stranger to hosting the Games. In 1974, the purpose-built Kiwi Toon Park hosted over 1,200 competitors from 38 countries. This morning Glasgow opened this year's Games, with a handful of Cantabrians representing New Zealand. Rangiora's Angie Smith will take to the track in the 800 metres and South Canterbury's Tom Walsh is up against some of the world's best in the shot put. Coming up, we have an exclusive interview with the Chief Executive of the Insurance Council. Al Jazeera News. International news right off the satellite bringing you up to the minute coverage of world events. Al Jazeera News, weekday mornings at 6 o'clock, right here on CTV. Located at the foot of the Port Hills, Berrymead Golf offers a spectacular location for any occasion. Make a dream wedding a reality with private use of our green function room, outdoor garden courtyard, large marquee and stunning gazebo. Or for your next conference, enjoy the relaxed atmosphere of Berrymead Golf offering a private, spacious conference room with special deals to make any break a true break. All with customised catering from the WOW Cafe. Ferrymead Goal, 50 Ferrymead Park Drive, right next to the Ferrymead Heritage Park. Avoid the monkeys when it comes to relocating. Trust A1 Movers, a family business since 1993 that guarantees a professional job every time. We carefully handle and wrap your valued items, ensuring they have a safe journey. Secure storage and insurance options are also available. A1 Movers, the careful, caring, moving company. Oi! 
Action Removals, offering short or long-term storage facilities, full packing services, comprehensive rates, all fully insured and with six vehicle sizes to choose from. Earthquake Repairs, Action Removals, pack, move, store and return your valuable possessions stress-free. Action Removals, a family business that has been operating in Christchurch for over 10 years. Action Removals, your one-stop removal service on time, every time. 0800 222 526. Arts 21 showcases the vast creative talent and minds that are making a name for themselves in Europe and beyond. Think outside the square with Arts 21. Tim Grafton, Chief Executive of the Insurance Council, gave CTV an exclusive interview today. I asked him what the Insurance Council's view was on EQC telling Flockton Basin residents they may not be insured because the flooding was an existing problem. To a, what's called a declaratory judgment to clarify uh, what the situation is with respect to uh, land damage as a result of the earthquake uh, and obviously that'll have implications for people in the Flockton Basin. So that will be argued through in court uh, on late October this year uh, and uh, our view is, is that uh, land has uh, dropped uh, and because land has dropped as a result of the earthquakes, uh, there are properties that are more flood prone uh, and whether they qualify for compensation by EQC or not, that's part of the uh, argument that we have in court uh, with them on that. What is the insurer's view though on the 9,000 homes that potentially could have increased um, flooding vulnerability? Well, it's an awful lot of people, a lot of houses, uh, and uh, clearly that's one that's of concern. Uh, to my knowledge, no insurer has withdrawn insurance cover, but I am aware that uh, the excess, that is the amount that people pay up front before the insurance money kicks in, uh, has risen to five, up to $10,000 for flood damage uh, and the question is is that over time will we see mitigation measures put in place uh, council's been talking about plans to uh, put in pumping stations widen culverts if that comes in and reduces the risk then obviously uh, it affects the insurance approach but it's for each individual insurer to make that decision as to how much risk they want to take on and how they price that do you anticipate that the insurance companies will go on offering um, protection against flooding if in fact those mitigation um, initiatives don't take place or could we see a situation where if you're in a flood prone property you're offered uh, insurance against fire and theft and the answer is sorry we don't cover flooding? Well I can't sort of rule that out. Uh, I'd like to think that that is most unlikely uh, simply because uh, one of the mechanisms that insurers can uh, introduce is to provide an excess so that the first uh, amount of damage is not covered by insurance and so flood protection insurance in the worst possible cases of damage can be uh, continue to be in place and that's what we're seeing in Flockton which is the most severely affected part of Christchurch at the moment. Now do insurers have an obligation do you think to pay compensation to people who've been living in cold damp leaking damaged houses where their insurance claim hasn't been settled after, after four years who has the responsibility for helping those people out? Uh, very good question. Uh, I mean, ultimately for the insurer in terms of liability, it rests on what the insurance policy provides for. Uh, the insurance policy does provide for six months of accommodation outside of a property, and often that's to the value of about $20,000. Uh, so there is that coverage within a policy, but uh, in terms of additional compensation over and above what an insurance policy provides for, no, insurers uh, don't have that liability. So if there is additional compensation, I think that that's an issue that needs to be addressed uh, on a wider scale. So is that, is that the sort of conversation that should be taking place between residents, communities, councils and governments in that case? Uh, I think so, and people might want to ask the same questions of, of their insurers, but the situation in, re in reality is, is that delays that have occurred are usually have a lot of dependence 
dependencies. They're not just uh, an insurance issue. They're an issue that may relate, and we've just been talking about flood and land uh, with EQC, or uh, it may relate to uh, a whole bunch of other issues, uh, like uh, the need for retaining walls to be fixed on somebody else's property so you can advance yours, and that person doesn't have the uh, wherewithal to be able to fix it. So it's a complicated situation that isn't simply answered by saying, well, it's taken this amount of time, insurers should pay me compensation. It's only what the policy applies uh, that uh, leads to any compensation. Now, in a situation where a uh, house owner's um, house has been repaired, but the repairs are defective in some way, um, are the insurers liable or responsible, or what should their response be? Oh, look, your insurance policy provides you for a reinstatement of your property uh, as new. Uh, and so if uh, it's a defective property, then you should go back to your insurer and you should uh, ask them and complain, uh, get them to look at it. There's an internal disputes resolution uh, service within each insurer. Uh, they'll have someone independent uh, with, who hasn't been dealing with your case before to have a look at it. Uh, and if you're still not satisfied, you can go through to dispute resolution schemes uh, to take that uh, issue up further. So really it comes down to, I think, any insurer doesn't want to be insuring a defective house. Uh, any insurer will have a contract with uh, the uh, builder that's building the house for you if they're part of the uh, management of that rebuild. Uh, so they will uh, be able to go to you know the builder and say, well, you know, why didn't you do the uh, good job for us? So I think there are means of addressing that. Yeah. On tomorrow's news, we'll play the rest of the interview where Tim Grafton talks about the implications of natural disasters on the insurance industry in New Zealand. Still to come, the traffic and weather updates. Flash News 7 at Red and Black Sport gets a new title as well, but we'll still be talking every week to the movers and shakers in sport. Red and Black Sport, Monday night, 7.30, here on CTV. Come in and meet the locals at the Bush Inn Centre. Whether it's to grab a coffee on the go or to catch up with a friend over lunch or dinner, the Bush Inn Centre is the perfect place. With our unique range of shops, you'll find everything you're looking for and more. Our friendly locals are always happy to help. We have plenty of parking at the Bush Inn Centre, making your shopping experience just a little bit easier. So come in, meet the locals and shop Bush Inn. You'll find us on the corner of Rickerton and Waimari Roads. Hi, I'm Steve and welcome to Carpet Kingdom. At Carpet Kingdom we stock a massive range of carpets and we're also the largest vinyl stockers in the South Island. And not only do we have an excellent range in store, but you can purchase our stock online. We offer free measuring quotes, we have our own installation team, we ship nationwide, so come on down and see us at Carpet Kingdom. 312 Wilson's Road in Waltham, just off Bryham Street, or visit us online at carpetkingdom.co.nz. Blue Star Taxis has been servicing the Canterbury region for over 80 years. Canterbury owned and operated with the passion for providing safe, reliable public transport in Christchurch to Cantabrians and visitors to our city. Home safe every time with Blue Star Taxis. Get rid of that damaging and unsightly moss, mould and lichen from your path, drive or roof with Mossbuster. Mossbuster is a no-bleach, non-abrasive, biodegradable solution that has over 35 years of proven results. Mossbuster costs less than half the price of other well-known products and can be yours for less than a dollar a litre. You just spray it on and let Mother Nature do the rest. Check out our website to find the best solution to your moss, mould and grime problem. Order online or call us now on 0800 88 1000. G'day, this is Fletch, your presenter of the TV show Classic Restos. It's the show where it's your chance to see completed restorations being shown, driven and enjoyed. If you're driving around the Christchurch Central City, CTV's traffic update will assist you navigating the repairs taking place.
Kia ora, travellers. To help you plan your journey around the central city, here's some tips on how to get around this week. Armagh Street remains closed between Colombo and Manchester Street. Kilmore Street is one lane between Madras and Colombo Street. And good news, Durham Street is now back to two lanes as the current work is now completed. Also, remember to get around town quicker, make use of the four avs. To keep up to date on what's happening on the Central City Road, stay tuned to CTV News First at 5, and in the meantime, visit the Transport for Christchurch website. And finally tonight, your regional weather. Kia ora Canterbury, let's take a look at your region's weather. First up in Timaru, 10, and Tamuka and Geraldine hit 11 today. Moving along to Methven, Ashburton and also Rakaia, 10 degrees. Darfield, Leeston and Ralston, 10 degrees today. Lincoln and Christchurch hit 10 also. And over in Akadawa, hopefully warmer than yesterday with 10 degrees. Let's take a look at what's been happening in North Canterbury. Rangiura and Kaipui 11 degrees and in Amberley 11 as well. Colverton and Hanna Springs hope you've had a lovely Thursday hitting 11 today, Cheviot 11 degrees and up the top in Kaikoura 10 degrees. But what about what's in store for tomorrow? In Timaru mostly cloudy for your Friday but do expect some cool southwesterly winds hitting an overnight low of zero and a high of 8 degrees. <laughs> In Ashburton, cloudy and cold for your Friday. Not to worry though, some sunny periods will develop during the afternoon, as well as moderate southwesterly winds, hitting an overnight low of zero and a high of eight degrees. In Christchurch, plenty of cloud about, and there is a risk of light showers on the Banks Peninsula. You can also expect some cold southwesterly winds heading your way as well hitting an overnight low of zero and a high during the day of eight degrees. And up the top in Kaikoura, mostly cloudy, with cool southwesterly winds expected, hitting an overnight low of one and a high of eight degrees. And in other areas around the region, Tamuka and Geraldine are chilly minus one overnight and a high of nine. Methvin hitting a high of nine as well and Rakaia a high of eight degrees. Darfield, Leeston, Ralston and Lincoln hitting an overnight low of minus one and a high of eight. Over in Akadawa expect cloud with a high of eight. Dangira and Kaipui will be cool with an overnight low of minus one. In Culverton, Hanmer Springs and Cheviot have a high of nine and an overnight low of minus one. And looking ahead for what's in store for Canterbury. Changeable on Saturday with periods of cloud and maybe a few light showers at times, but mostly dry and some sunny periods as well. We do expect it to be cold with moderate to fresh southwesterly winds. Cloud will be clearing and sunny periods increasing during the day on Sunday. With moderate cold southwesterlies dying out, it will be frosty at night though. Fine from Monday to Wednesday with sunny periods and high cloud and moderate north to northeasterly winds. Expect milder daytime temperatures. And that's all for your region's weather. Have a lovely evening. And that's CTV News for Thursday. I'm Grant Mangan. Good night. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.